It's that idea of like, could I go out and live in the woods for three straight days with nothing but a pocket knife or something? You're like, you know, if I told my wife that, my wife would be like, why would you want to do that? And I'm like, that sounds awesome. Are you serious? Like that sounds, and we're just wired different. Well, straw man's kind of the same way. You see this giant rock. You're like, I wonder if I can pick that up. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. You're listening to Matt Reynolds. I am here with my buddy, long time. Gosh, dude, we've known each other for a long time now. Spencer Graham. Spencer, I met Spencer. Spencer actually back in his early college days uh, worked at Strong Gym and and uh, was a hell of yeah. a coach for us. And uh, that's kind of how the thing all got started. Spencer has since started his own gym, GP Athletics, and is really the premier the premier gym, strength based gym in Southwest Missouri and really maybe in the Midwest. Um, he just continues to crush it. Um, there's a part of me that I probably feel like, like I'm excited to watch what you've done, uh, not to take any credit for what you've done. I just think it's really cool to see, you know, you were this, uh, young college kid many years ago working at strong and watch how you've, uh, really expanded your own business. So, so thanks for being on the show. This is another one of our Springfield crew. A lot of you guys know we've got like Cooper Mitchell from Garage Gym Reviews, and we've got a, a pretty good strength uh, group of people here in Springfield. And so Spencer is one of those important people that you guys haven't met yet, and it was time for you to meet him. So thanks for being on the show, dude. Yeah, man, no problem at all. I appreciate being on the show. So what I wanted to talk about today primarily was the fact that we get a lot of questions about how to bring some strongman training into your programming and with the knowledge that, so first, first off, most of you guys know that there was a day when I was a, a lightweight, a light heavyweight pro strongman. That was back when I was decently strong. Now I'm just old and retired and beat up. <laughs> Spencer is an actual competitive strongman in the present um, and, is, and is pursuing his pro card right now. And so I wanted to bring him on. I just want to have a conversation knowing that most of our listeners will probably, probably not compete in strongman, or at least as they start to sort of put their toe into the pool, they're like, I don't know, I'm not interested in even considering competing, but I'd like to know how to just start some of that stuff because it looks really cool. And so I wanted to have a conversation around that today. Um, you know, I started, I started powerlifting, I think in 97 and still love powerlifting, but, um, in, by 2005, so after doing it for eight years, I mean, it's just three lifts, it's squat, bench and dead. That's it. And I was, I was kind of bored of just doing that. Like I was decently strong and you know, I was like guys that have, you know, strong legs and strong backs are kind of a dime a dozen. And so, um, you know, I was never going to be great really at either sport, but I just thought, gosh, it'd be cool to, to pick it up rocks and flipping tires and pulling cars looks cooler to me than just squatting and just deadlifting and things like that. And so I made a transition into strongman. And I remember in the beginning for me, I was like, dude, I don't have any idea how to start this because gyms, most gyms don't have that now and no gyms had it then, you know, um, what did that transition look like for you? And I remember you had just started to kind of get into the strongman world as, as we sold strong and, uh, and, but you've really taken that and expanded tremendously over the last, over the last decade or so. Yeah, well, well, that's kind of the cool thing with Strongman is, you know, if you don't have access to a gym, you can still compete in Strongman and you can still train for Strongman because Strongman training is only moving odd objects, right? And so, you know, if you have tires at your house, or if you have ropes, if you have anything heavy that you can carry, you can start training for Strongman. And Strongman, uh, the foundation of it is still going to be your overhead press, strong legs with a yoga or squat, um, and your deadlifts. So those are things that we can manipulate in your garage training or just outside in training to get those same effects to get you ready for strongman and the cool thing about that is is you don't have to be super strong to compete um, there are different weight classes there's a bigger variety there is um you know they have novice classes where you can go in and you're like i just kind of want to get my feet wet because the most the most popular thing i ever hear is i'm not quite ready for strongman i'm not strong enough yet and the issue with that is is strongman you don't start being you know, Brian Shaw, Thor, you don't start out being that strong. Um, but people have the idea that you have to because they're not 
familiar with Strongman Corporation and the Federation that allowed you to go through that feeder system to get to that top level. Yeah, it's, that's great. You know, the interesting thing is they didn't have that back when I started. Like that novice that novice class, I think, um, you may know more about this, I think it kind of came out of the the CrossFit craze. Like you had people that had done CrossFit and CrossFit, you know, Rogue started making some stuff that they would do. So you'd start to see things like yokes or, you know, what was the, uh, was it called the pig? What was the thing they flipped? It was like flipping a tire in the CrossFit games, but it wasn't a tire. Remember that thing? It was like a big, oh, it's, a big on <laughs> it's like a big, it's a big, like, I mean, but it was basically like a tire flip. It was just a giant thing that Rogue had, had made. And so you started to see CrossFitters come in and want to play around with strongman implements. And, and the reality was back in like 2005, 2006, if you weren't, very strong it would have been hard to compete in strongman like you know there there was there was you had to do a car deadlift and the car was heavy the car might have been 600 650 pounds for reps and a lot of people couldn't do that and now that they have that novice class which is the it's that hey just come out and have fun class i think it's been really awesome that they've done that made that feeder system so that there is like from the people that just want to have a blast on a saturday and and play with some implements that they've never done before all the way up to your Kind of, are they still called platinum shows or pro ams or what are what are the yeah they actually um just last year they changed the rules to where uh, you used to be able to get your pro card at platinum shows but there's still only two or three platinum shows a year um, and at those platinum shows you just have your 231 heavyweights um, or your currently pro strongman going for American strongest man they usually combine yeah. those um, and yeah you're right CrossFit it, it honestly helped strongman tremendously because back in the day you only really only had two weight classes. I mean, it was 231 and under and 231 and above. And now because we've had such an influx of CrossFit athletes and just people wanting to strike strongman overall, we've got 181 classes, 198, 231, 265, all the way up yeah. um, and those novice classes. So it's just helped us grow the sport of strongman so much. Yeah. And pros are still just those two big weight classes. Is that right? There's only still the 105 kilo or 231 and above 105 kilo, basically. That's right for pro. Correct. Yeah. So, so you started to mention this, um, and you may look at it, you, you may sort of systematically separate all of the kind of strongman training into maybe different categories than I would. So I'll, I'll tell you what I looked at. So there's almost always some sort of overhead press at a strongman event. Not always, but most of the time. Absolutely, it, but yeah. And it's, it's usually, but you never know what it's going to be. So it could be an axle, it could be a log, it could be an odd implement, it could be a, it could be a stone, I mean, it could be a block. It could be a, a one arm dumbbell press or snatch or um, or the circus dumbbell. Like there's it, it like you said, it's odd implements. It's the kind of stuff you would have seen at the circus in the late 1800s, early 1900s. These guys that were you know these traveling strongmen. It was like I don't. They're gonna pick heavy stuff up. So so there is an overhead press for most of our listeners. One of the things I love about that is they they've all been overhead pressing for years. They're just been overhead pressing with a barbell. And so it's pretty simple to switch over and start playing with some of those odd implements. You know, those those empty axles that Rogue or any really any of the equipment companies sell, they're pretty cheap, right? They're basically just schedule 80 pipe and you can start playing with axles and go and go from there. And so where where would be the best place to start playing around with overhead press with odd implements if you were somebody that either just had a garage gym or maybe you train at a, a decent black iron gym, but they don't really have strongman equipment? Uh, best place is honestly go to your local hardware store because um, they're going to have uh, bags of sand and bags of dirt. Yeah. Um, and those are going to be the best things for you to start overhead pressing because they're, they're not so fixed, you know, sand moves, dirt moves, bags bend. Um, and they give you that neutral grip pressing and that neutral grip is going to be uh, beneficial for your log press. It's going to be beneficial for Mauser block presses, anything like that. Um, your axle, heck, you can go to a, a junkyard and buy, an old truck's axle and use anything you want really. Yeah. Um, and then inside the gym, you know, incline bench press is going to be super beneficial. Um, and you just change variations of that. You like a, for strongman, you like a little higher incline. So it's closer to an overhead press with maybe like a little bit of layback, or do you like more of a lower incline? That's a little closer to a bench press. Uh, I prefer just above 45 degrees. Okay. So a little bit higher. Yeah, absolutely. Just because when you have a log on your chest and you're trying to keep that center of mass balance, you have to lean back more. And if you were to just take a straight shot of a picture and then compare it to an inclined bench press picture, they're almost identical. 
Yeah. Um, you keep the chest towards the ceiling for as long as possible, and then you stick your head through at the end. You know, yeah. is it? And so it it's almost perfectly mimicking it. Yeah, yeah, that that makes perfect sense. Uh, on those sandbags, I can remember um, when I first built my first sandbag. That was one of the things I did. Was I went down to an old army surplus store. I bought a heavy duty duffel bag, like a canvas duffel bag. It was cheap because they're at an army surplus. I went and, and bought. I went and bought tube sand. I think I bought the tube sands, which I th I think were. 50 pounds, maybe they're 25 pounds. Anyway, I, I loaded a bunch of tube sand into a contractor trash bag. And I taped it all shut with duct tape and then put that big contractor trash bag down in the duffel bag and it held up pretty good. Is that, would you still do it that way? Is there a better way than what I did 15 years ago when I was doing this to kind of build your first sandbag press? No, I, I would do the exact same thing. Yeah. Um, Cause those, those army stores are gonna have a bigger variety um, and they're, they're not that expensive. And, you know, even if it turns out to be a big backpack, cut the shoulder straps off. You don't want straps on there. You don't want to make it easy. So yeah. <laughs> cut the straps off and uh, fill it up with sand and tube sand or anything you can, honestly. I don't know if you remember this story. I, I think I've told you the story in the past, but back when I was first getting into it, I was broke. I mean, I was this, been, this is 2005. This is before we launched Strong. And, of course, Strong made exactly no money for the first at least five or six years that we had it, right? So, I mean, I was broke college kids. Matter of fact, 2005, I can remember I had just started training strongman when my daughter, uh, a few weeks before my daughter was born. And remember the first time I left for a few hours, uh, in her first week of life, by the way, and she is about to turn 16 and start, you know, and have her own driver's license. And so it was like, it just doesn't seem like that long ago. I can remember. So I used to work in the old days. I worked at the, the South side YMCA here in Springfield. And I, they had a huge, like a, a huge drainage ditch kind of retaining wall made out of giant quarry stone. I mean, big white limestone quarry rocks. And I called the manager of the of the YMCA, which I had no longer worked at, but I still knew him okay. And I was like, hey, there are literally, I don't know, seven or 800 massive rock quarry stones that sort of separated the land between the YMCA and the soccer fields, if you can think, if you know about where that is. And what would you yeah, think yeah. if I loaded up a few of those stones in the back of my truck? And I, I don't know, just took them. <laughs> he was like, I'm not going to tell you you can, but I'm also not going to tell you you can't. And here's what I'll tell you. If you come at this time of day at the, on this day, there probably isn't going to be anybody around to see you and tell you no. And so I went, I remember my brother and I going out there. We had a great big beach towel. We would roll one of those. We took one of those rocks up and rolled it on a beach towel. We both, you know, we all picked up the corners and carried it on the beach towel and threw it in the threw it in the back of my truck. And then we'd have a stone. So we, you know, we probably had a stone that weighed anywhere from maybe one twenty five to one fifty for the smallest, and the biggest one was probably two hundred pounds. A two hundred pound stone, even if you're a three hundred or near three hundred pound presser, a two hundred pound stone is not a real easy stone to press. It'll humble you in a heartbeat because it's not like holding a barbell. No, not at all. And it, yeah, it, it's rough. And, you know, they have uh, the Mauser blocks now, but the, I mean. And what are those? Are, are those like big, are those like big cinder block type? What's a Mauser block? Basically, so a Mauser block is just, it's, I can't believe the exact, I can't remember the exact dimensions, but it's like eight inches thick. And I want to say it's, it's 14 inches by 24 inches. And it's a big hollow steel box that okay. has a removable side and you can load plates in there. Okay. Okay. And so basically it made, stone loading uh, and pressing easier for athletes. But yeah, they still have um, stones that you can have in competitions, you know, and, and just over the whole shutdown that we were just finally starting to get out of, I had a buddy who was training in his backyard. That's all he had was just a big rock. Yeah. You know, I lent him a barbell and a few plates, but that, that rock was the primary base of his training for strongman training. Yeah. yeah he, was probably, he was squatting with it. He was picking it up. He was loading it. He was probably shouldering it, everything he could do. Yeah. So okay, so that's overhead press. So we can play. You can play around with over press. Overhead press. Those axles are a blast. Also, you know, back in the day when I started finding something like a like a log was really difficult because there, there was no rogue. Rogue wasn't out yet. And of course, now you've got all of these plates. Like there's so many companies that make logs. Logs are cheaper and more accessible than they ever used to be, and they're a blast to be able to to press a log. And the the standard when I was when I competed, and I assume it's kind of similar, is is a 12 inch diameter log. Maybe it's a little bigger, maybe it's a little smaller, but that's going to be in the ballpark. And so for our listeners who have thought about it, Spencer mentioned this that, you know, with a barbell, that center, that center of mass or center of gravity, that balance point 
of the barbell being over midfoot, that's pretty easy when it's a barbell because it's 28 millimeters, right? 28 and a half millimeters. But a 12-inch a log a third, automatically puts that log at least six inches away from your chest or away from your throat. And that's why you have to have such a big lean back. That's why you were talking about why you have to do the incline press to train that a lot of times because it's the balance is so much harder on the log than it is with a barbell. Yeah, no, and you're right. Logs are more accessible than they've ever been. And, uh, you know, honestly, Rogue has been such a huge supporter of Strongman in the sport. Um, but, you know, you've got these other smaller companies who are busting out logs left and right. And that makes it more accessible for, you know, and you mentioned this earlier, Strongman is not a wealthy sport. if <laughs> You're not the strongest in the world. Sure. You know, it's it's hard to get your hands on implements and things like that. So, you know, just a few weeks ago, if you want to train log, just a few weeks ago, I was at my family farm and we had cut down a bunch of trees and that's all I had. So I had 10, 12 foot logs and, you know, you put those up on your lap, you pick them up like a zercher carry, you roll them up to your chest and you start to overhead press them. Yeah. So if you can't get your hands on a log, there's still a lot of things that you can do to manipulate that same movement pattern. Like what's Here's what's funny about that is like, the point of the lift was that in the old days, guys would actually pick up logs, like actual trees that have been cut down, and they would press the log. And then we got into the same. We're like, well, we'll make this like metal version of that, aluminum versions of logs that are loadable with weights. And the funny thing is, like full circle, you, you're like, well, in the middle of COVID, we didn't have access to actual logs. I was out on the family farm. I mean, to, to strongman logs that were built by Rogue. So I had to press actual logs that were cut down out of the woods <laughs> which is like the point of the thing in the beginning and it was the most difficult thing i'd ever done you know yeah, so <laughs> yeah. there there is no warm-up like it you can't take your your 20 or 50 pound warm-ups man it's like i've got i've got a 90 pound tree limb and i've got a 200 pound log that's right well i guess i'm gonna make this jump and see how it goes <laughs> yeah, that's right right not exactly incremental increases so all right so that's overhead press then the other thing that i think is almost always in a strongman competition is some form of deadlift so whether it's a deadlift for max whether it's a car deadlift for reps you're picking up maybe it's just a super heavy farmer's walk which is similar but you're picking up something heavy via a deadlift you actually I mean, you, certainly you can see something like a, a version of a squat in a strongman competition, but it's not common. And that doesn't mean that I think that probably every strongman in the world squats like that's that's still the king of the lifts because it it just creates the most general strength. But is that is that still pretty much the case that there's something heavy that you're going to pick up off the ground on just about every single strongman competition that you see? Yeah, absolutely. And they've, they've added so many implements to training. So, you know, like your farmers and your deadlifts are going to be real similar. It's side pick or front pick. Um, you've got duck walk now, power stairs. Um, heck, you've got sandbag, you know, picks, and then you run with them. So, yeah, yeah those are all lifting movements from the ground. And so deadlifting, as far as gym owners go or home gym owners, just your basic deadlift is going to be super beneficial. But if you want to implement that into strongman training, it's going to be the exact same thing. It's, it's going to be, you know, deadlift for reps in a minute. It's going to be max deadlifts. Um, you can do max hold, things like that. And then, uh, like we had just talked about with the stones, pick the stone up and deadlift it as many times as you can. Yeah. Um, that strongman implements are laying everywhere. People just kind of have to use their imagination, just make it happen. Yeah. Yeah, so the interesting thing about those deadlifts is that in strongman, a lot of times you'll have a, a shorter range of motion deadlift. You might have a silver dollar deadlift, an 18 inch deadlift, like which is, you know, so it's nine inches shorter than your standard deadlift. And that silver dollar deadlift, a lot of times is for max, but sometimes it's for reps. A lot of times those side handle deadlifts, a farmer's deadlift or a car deadlift, so it's a side pick, a lot of times that's for reps. And so you, rather than just training in the sort of typical, LP style, three sets of five or something like that, you have to train for strongman, both for super max effort lifting and also super like how many reps can you knock out in 60 seconds? And by the way, for our listeners, if you haven't actually tried to deadlift max reps in 60 seconds, it's awful. Like it's not fun. No, it's the worst thing in the world. <laughs> and that's, that's kind of the cool thing with strongman is not only do you have to be super strong, but you have to be athletic and your strength endurance has to be through the roof. Yeah. And people underestimate that. Yeah. Yeah. The, you get to a show. It's often 
the the guy you can see the guys who can recover the fastest, right? They have a super hard event Absolutely. and 15, 20 minutes later, they're doing another super hard event. Like how well can your body recover, your heart rate drop back down, that that uh, kind of core body temperature come back down to a normal place and here we go again. And, you know, hopefully my body's replenished most of the creatine and the glycogen and I'm ready to roll. And so I always love that about Strongman. I felt like it was the best of both worlds. I felt like I felt, and I still feel this way, that powerlifting tends to be just a little more like it's just heavy, and you don't really have to be an athlete to be a powerlifter. And I don't mean that in a negative sort of way. Like, I think there's some amazing people who are powerlifters who clearly are athletes, right? It's, it's kind of like baseball. Do you have to be an athlete to be a professional baseball player? Like, I don't know. Are there good athletes in baseball? Oh, yeah, right? So there's some amazing athletes out there in powerlifting, but you don't really have to be an athlete. And then you've got CrossFit, where you don't really have to be strong, but you really got to be fit. Like you better, have, you've got an incredible aerobic base, an incredible conditioning base. What I love about strongman is it combines the best of those two worlds. You got to be strong, and you got to be in an amazing condition. Yeah, absolutely. And and with that, uh, being strong and being in really good condition is it's going to be one of those things that we take into account, like rehab and prehab, and what are we doing? Because you're right, you know. Uh, just this past January, I competed at um, Platinum Plus Show, Odd Hogan Platinum Plus Show. And it was a two-day event, and we had uh, six events, but one of the events was mass wrestling, right? So mass wrestling, uh, for the listeners who aren't aware of what that is, is it's basically two guys fighting over a stick from the floor. <laughs> yeah, so let, let me paint a picture. So you're both, so there's like a big, I don't know what it is, a two-by-eight or two-by-ten type board sitting between you and the other guy. You're sitting on the floor with your feet sort of straight out in front of you, your feet are pushed up against the board. The other guy's on the other side of the board with his feet up against the board, and then you've, you're wrestling over a stick. Is that right? A rod or something. Is, is, what are you fighting for? It's a little over an inch long um, dowel rod, basically, is what it is. I got it. So I wrote, the side note to this story is, is that I, I have a membership at your gym, which I go at least once every two months, and... <laughs> <laughs> but I was in there. I was in there training with you, and you were like, "Hey, I need you to do this this mass wrestling with me." And I was like, "No, hashtag not interested." And you're like, "Why?" I was like, "Dude, I'm 41. I'm gonna tear a bicep doing this thing. Like, I don't want to. Nope, 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 nope. Not interested." So yeah. So then I watched, and then it's funny because one of your primary training partners at the gym is like, he has the frame of a of like Brian Shaw. He has that kind of frame. He's super tall. I don't know, the guy's like 6'5", and he's over way over 300 pounds, and he's not fat. He's just a huge, huge dude. And you're like, all right, I guess I'm going to have to, like, wrestle him for this thing. Yeah, bro, I'm going to wrestle this guy. And <laughs> yeah, it was it was awful. And, yeah, so, like, and where I was going with that story is, you know, it was best two out of three. So <sighs> you don't compete once. You're competing potentially three times. So I think, it's, you know, on Sunday when we finally finished the competition, I had actually competed – uh, like 13 times and I yeah. came down with rhabdo. So. Yeah. Oh, that's right. You got rhabdo. I, I had never heard of somebody getting rhabdo from a strongman competition, but it was a two day, two day event, really strange. And you, you came home and what, did you just feel like, I don't know, like uber fatigued and dehydrated? Like what, how did you know something was wrong? It's like, you know, when you compete in strongman after every competition, you feel like you were hit by a bus. It just felt like I was hit by a couple of buses. <laughs> right. You know, like Saturday was really hard to cover because it's hard to eat um, while you're competing. And those days are, you know, anywhere from six to eight hours long. And so Monday I came home and I felt fatigued and tired and I wasn't really that sore. Tuesday I was still really fatigued and tired. And then Wednesday I woke up and I was kind of pale and I was real nauseous. And so when I went into uh, the doctor clinic, I told them what happened and I pretty sure you have rhabdo. We're going to do a urine analysis. And like, you're not leaving this clinic until we get an IV and you're down for the next two hours. Yeah. So they pumped me full of IVs. And then I went back to work that night and I was actually sitting at the front desk greeting guests as they came in with an IV hooked up. So <laughs> it, was, it was crazy. It is. That is crazy. So, all right. So you've got, so you get your overhead and you can press. The idea there is you can press anything, find things to press, find rocks to press, sandbags to press, axles, whatever you can find that's heavy, the kind of stuff you would have done as a 12 or 13 year old kid out in the woods, you know, like, Hey, I bet I can pick up that log. Hey, I can bet I can pick up that rock. That's really what strongman is. And so you can start doing those things. Um, and really all again, and, and overhead presses, the same situation as deadlift. There are overhead presses for max strength and there's overhead presses for as many reps as you can. And then sometimes you'll have like an odd implement 
um, overhead press medley where you have to do you know four or five different movements. So like maybe you press a maybe you press a keg and then maybe you press an axle and then you press a log and then and it's whoever gets through the medley the fastest or whoever completes the most odd objects. So that's really the way most of those overhead presses are set up in strongman. Um, in deadlift, it's kind of a similar situation. So you can deadlift all kinds of different things. You can do just you'll even sometimes still see just a regular normal deadlift, like a powerlifting style deadlift. You can usually use straps in strongman and you can hitch in yep. strongman. Um, so it's just like we don't care how you get it up. It starts on the ground. It has to end with completely locked out hips, knees, etc., uh, and you know, and chest up. Um, and there's lots of ways to train for that as well. So you can change. You can do deficit deadlifts to make the range of motion longer. You can do rack pulls to make the range of motion shorter. You can go for max weight. You can go for max reps. Um, you can also then pick up those rocks in sort of a deadlift sort of scenario. Pick up heavy sandbags. Pick up heavy kegs pick up things like that. Those are all things that you can do. Um, and then you get into what I would call like the real athletic stuff, which I, I would equate, like it's where you have to move. And so maybe that's a yoke where you have something on your back. And so, I mean, just imagine picking up, essentially imagine picking up way heavier than your max effort, heaviest squat you've ever squatted in your whole life and then running down the street with it as fast as you can. <laughs> that's, a, that's a yoke, right? Or uh, farmers are the same thing. So you do a farmer's walk. So it's like the two heaviest suitcases you ever picked up, heavier than your heaviest deadlift, right? So, I mean, I can remember doing the farmer's walks at four. The heaviest one I've ever done in competition was 400 pounds per hand. So it's 800 pounds. Well, I wasn't an 800-pound deadlifter. I'm a 700-pound deadlifter picking up farmer's walks. And the handle's are a little higher. So, you know, you don't have to pick it up from quite as low of a position. But you stand up with it. And then you run down the street as fast as you can, right? Or you pick up these heavy sandbags and you run down the street and then maybe you load them over a yoke or maybe you load them on a platform or, or you, or, and then of course the, one of the most famous, uh, lifts you have, one of the most famous events you have are stones where you just pick up big stones, which might be natural stones, but are more often than not perfectly round spheres made out of concrete. And you load those onto a platform or you load those over a, a yoke and then, You've got tire flips, right? Where you've got a, it's basically like the most explosive power clean you've ever done. Only it's seven or eight or 900 pounds and you continue to throw the thing as hard as you can and it falls over and you're exhausted and you got to pick it up and do it again and then again and then again and then again for 75 feet or so. Yeah, it's how like do everything you, you can imagine like is the worst thing you can do. Yeah. And then we're going to compete with it. That's exactly right. Then we're going to see who can do it the fastest and then. So I remember, um, yeah, I, I know you're, you're a student of the strongman game too, but I remember back when I was winning my pro card. So I've told this story lots of times about Brian Shaw and I won our pro cards at the same, at the same competition. And back then, Brian Shaw weighed between 275 and 295. Like he was way under 300 pounds. He's not the 450 that he is or was. I think he's lost a little bit of weight lately, but it was in his heyday, right? He's not a Thor. Nobody was that big. And as a matter of fact, Phil Fister had won, was the, was the first American to win, I think, since Bill Kazmaier. And this was back about the time I started to compete. And so what you, would, what you saw was you saw a strongman move from those Magnus Ver Magnuson years, Phil Fister years of like very athletic. The guys were super strong, but they were like mostly athletic to Goliath, like of Old Testament biblical proportions dudes. And they were like, you know what? Let's just do the same athletic stuff, but let's make it like, oh, I don't know, 50% heavier than it's ever been ever. And it just got ridiculous. And that's when I knew, like I, I was stuck in this weird sort of sort of body size that like I needed to be a 265. And there, what, there isn't a pro 265. So I'm like, I'm going to have to cut way down and try to make 231s to compete. Or I got to compete with those guys, the Brian Shaws, which at the time was 290 and 6'6", six, six or 6'7", six, or whatever it was. And I looked at that, and I was like, I'm ne I could never compete with that, having no idea that that guy was going to put another 150 pounds on to do what they're doing today. And so it got really crazy. Now, here's the question. For our people who are listening who've never done this, like they can play around with those overhead implements, and they can play around with the deadlift. What are the best ways to introduce them to these very athletic, and I think – way more fun versions of cardio like rather than getting on a on the you know the rogue echo bike which is a great cardio piece or a rower or whatever like it's way more fun to do the strongman stuff where are great places to start with those pick something up heavy and move with it um so obviously 
you're going to want to learn how to do it first. Um, and I'm going to kind of plug Kale Beck here in Starting Strongman. Starting Strongman is a platform where you can go and you can learn absolutely everything you need to about Strongman, from building your at-home implements to just the forms of questions and answers. And that's a really good place to start because you're right. If you're a power lifter and you're you're moving in a vertical range of motion constantly, squat, bench, and deadlift. Uh, when you go over to strongman and you have to move in every plane of motion and not only just be uh, like super strong at it, but we got to make sure you don't get hurt as well. Otherwise, you're going to be out for a long time. And so going and learning those movements just from YouTubes or uh, starting strongman, start super, super light technique is going to be absolutely everything because uh, if you waste yourself on technique, you're not going to be able to finish the lift anyways. You know, if you've got a heavy log clean, let's learn how to pick it up first, and then let's learn how to press it. We're going to put it into two steps. Um, so really starting light. Um, and if you have a local strongman show, you know, here in Missouri, we're getting more strongman shows. Uh, we have a Missouri Strongest Man August 15th. If you're in the area, just come watch it. You know, go watch a local strongman show. Or, you know, a lot of times CrossFitters will add in the most implements on a, on a weekend just go check out the CrossFit gym and see how they're moving with the implements. Yeah. Um, Cause that's, that's, you've got to have an idea. You can't just go out and be like, Oh, this looks like a big heavy rock. I'm going to pick this up and see how it goes. Yeah. Let's, you know, injury and strongman is huge. Yeah. And so I <laughs> highly recommend the listeners going and go and kind of research how to move it first. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing that with like, there's a tremendous amount, like you said, of, of content that's out there to kind of learn how to do that stuff. I saw probably more bicep tears than anything else in strongman because of the nature of picking up heavy stones off the floor. And you think about it for our for our listeners, you think about a four hundred pound stone that's on the floor. It's not like picking up a four hundred pound barbell. It's not even like picking up a six hundred pound barbell, which is nine inches off the floor and it's got great grip. And you, I mean, you literally have to bend over and essentially do a straight leg rounded back deadlift with your hands dug deep underneath the stone on the floor and pick that thing up. And there's there's the pickup portion where you pick, you pick it up, you don't bend your elbows at all. You pick it up and you stand up with sort of a hip extension and put the thing in your lap. And then you get control of it once it's on your lap and you can load it either over a yoke or onto a platform or whatnot. I've seen a ton of guys tear biceps on on a stone lift. I've seen a ton of guys tear biceps on tire flips for the same reason, right? That tire flip is nothing more than a, an explosive clean. If you do a clean correctly, your hands, your arms, your elbows never bend. That's an arm pull, right? Like they don't, they don't bend until you finish throwing your hips and then your arms are like rope and they just kind of bend and then fling over. Well, a tire flips kind of the same way. If you try to curl a 900 pound tire up, that's a great way to tear a bicep. And it's not actually 900 pounds, right? Like it, the tire actually does weigh 900 pounds, but you're not deadlifting 900 pounds because of the physics that the, the tire is on an angle and it's slanted and you pick, pick the thing up. But it's a hip movement. And the, th the other thing I remember thinking to myself is that Strongman taught me was how to be explosive under extreme fatigue. Like anybody can be explosive on the first tire flip, but how do you be explosive on the 10th tire flip? Right. And that's, and that's, I'm going to backjack just a little bit, just so the listeners have an idea of the Atlas stone portion of it. Um, Atlas stones are really only going to be about 60 ish percent of your deadlift max, just to kind of give you an idea of how yeah. hard stones are to lift. Um, and you're right. You know, it's when you get to that tire and you are on your 10th flip and it's honestly, it's, it's your muscles aren't working anymore. It's just your brain telling you and you being, uh, extremely mentally tough to be explosive again it's it's one of those things where your training carries over in you, you you practice like you compete and it's do a rep wait a few seconds do a rep wait a few seconds because oftentimes people just go out there and they absolutely waste themselves yeah. and the people who do waste themselves and they win in that event those are elite level athletes who are going to beat you anyway right right, right. <laughs> you're going to get those those one or two outcasts that are just going to dominate. And so if you're looking for a decent finish, it's a rep. Wait a second. Wait a rep. And everyone's going to be cheering. Hey, like, keep going, keep going, keep going. And you're like, mm, not really, because I still have 50 seconds left. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's like you've got to completely commit to each rep that you do. And so if you, and what you, I've seen a million guys do this, they, 
they get two thirds of the way into an event like that, like a like a tire flip or like a power stairs, which is imagine a giant rock or a giant anvil or like a giant weight with a hook. Imagine the biggest kettlebell you ever saw, like a kettlebell that weighs 350 pounds, like something like that. And you have to pick it up and put it and you have to go up a set of stairs, only it's not a set of stairs with a six or seven inch rise like you get on in your house. It's a set of stairs with what? What are they? 12 to 16 inches or something? I mean, they vary. They start at like 18 inches and they'll go to, you know, 22 inches for the middle stair and like <laughs> even harder. But then they'll drop it <laughs> right. back down to like 20 inches. <laughs> Yeah, so you, you think about it, if you if you approach that as you start getting tired, and you're like, all right, I'm going to pick up this ginormous kettlebell for all intents and purposes, and you're like, I'm just going to try to wiggle it up there, you're dead. Instead, you got to rest enough to go, okay, here we go, here we go, and boom, and you got to go hard and fast right then and be 100% committed to each of those reps, and that's, I, so we've talked a lot about over the years uh, on on this podcast about voluntary hardship, right, about these ideas that one of the reasons we train is because it refines us as people. It's like we choose to do a hard thing that we didn't have to do because it makes us better. And then when we when we face something that that is involuntarily hard, like we get cancer or like we lose our job in COVID or or whatever that thing is, you're you're better both physically and mentally to be able to fight that thing. The thing I love about strongman is I think it is maybe only second to to CrossFit and at least debatable with CrossFit, it's the thing that is the most hard, right? Like it is hard to fight under a heavy squat as a power lifter when you've never done the squat before and you're terrified coming up out of the hole. You're like, I don't know if I'm going to get this, right? But it's a whole nother deal in strongman to push your body far beyond what you ever thought it could possibly do. Yeah, no, it's, it's one of those things that you – and I tell everybody this, every great athlete, um, is, I'm going to say mentally different, uh, like psychologically, you just, you think differently, right? Because you're willing to go the extra step. That's what separates the average and the good athletes from the great and the elite. And yeah. it's that, it's that mental ability. It's that mindset of I'm, I'm going to die or I'm going to vomit, but I'm going to complete this, you know, whether it's a course in strongman where, you know, if it's that heavy yoke. You know, at the Arnold last year, I think it was like 1,400 pounds or something like that. It's unreal, right? Like, that, that's strongman is no longer, um, it's no longer really taking safe precautions when you're lifting. It's let's make this dangerous and super hard, yeah. right? So that's what's going to separate you. And that mental mindset and that focus in order to do so is extremely difficult to obtain. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, it's interesting that. You can't do anything about your physical natural ability, right? Like there are people who are just physical freaks. And if that's not you, that talent is probably going to be hard work. I mean, unfortunately, that's just the case, right? Like you're never going to win. Like no matter how, how, how hard you train, you're never going to be the, the world's strongest man in the heavyweights. Like you can't like you look at somebody like Thor or Brian Shaw and you're just like, I wasn't made that way, right? But you also have a lot of people that you see that actually, not a ton, but you'll see guys that are built to have massive frames and they don't have the mental toughness to be champion either. And then you'll see people that have that Rudy mentality that have the mental toughness that, I mean, they're the ones that you want in the, in the, in the foxhole with you if you go to war, like they're mentally tough. They just don't have the, the, the God-given physical abilities. The champions have both. I think that's the deal, right? You look at somebody like Thor, you look at somebody like Shaw or like, you know, or even you look at a guy like Eddie Hall who actually didn't really have the physical, like you look at Eddie Hall compared to a lot of those other guys and he's not even close to the same size as those guys. Something about his mental, something about his mental toughness allowed him to push through. By the way, a quick, quick shout out. If you haven't seen uh, Eddie, it's called Eddie the Strongman, I think on Netflix. It's a great documentary that that follows Eddie Hall before he won the world's strongest man, and then he he ended up winning for uh, for Great Britain a few years ago, and and it was really wild to see because he's he is he is significantly smaller. He held the all time deadlift record. He's held held the all time deadlift deadlift record a few times. Thor beat it a couple weeks ago, um, and the guy's just he's just one of those guys that's mentally mentally tough. Now here's the other thing. You said correctly that when you get into uber competitive strongman. 
we throw safety out the window. Like, nobody cares. They're there to see the freaks pick up the freakiest things and run with them, right? And we've talked about this on the podcast many times as well. No one would look at the NFL and be like, that's safe. It's not safe. You're running your head into people at 45 miles an hour multiple times per game, right? Like, it's not, that is not, a, nobody looks at UFC or boxing and says it's safe. So a big important takeaway for our listeners is this. There is a way to train strongman in a way that's relatively safe and really, really fun. Just like you said, starting conservative, starting with weights that you know you can handle, starting with implements you know you can do correctly, watching those videos, going and training in a strongman gym once or twice. Like even if you have to travel, most most major cities at this point have a gym full of with some strongmen and I'll say this, I think strongmen, my my experience is that strongmen are some of the nicest human beings on earth. They are they are more welcoming than powerlifters who are also tend to be pretty cool people and they love to teach because the the there's technique to every one of these lifts and most people don't know them, right? Like everybody has their own idea of how to squat or how to bench press. But how to do a yoke run? Who knows how to do a yoke run? Only strongmen with the experience that have done the yoke runs, right? So there's no like, oh, you know, what I love about strongman is it's pretty rare that you'll hear the old adage, you know, you'll talk about what you bench press and it's always somebody's like, oh, you know, my old Uncle Bob, he one time he bench pressed 840 pounds uh, in back in the weight room, you know, whatever. And you're like, you are so full of shit. But in strongman, nobody ever says if you're like, oh, I did a 930 pound yoke. Nobody's like, oh, you know what? Uncle Bob, he did a thousand fifty pound yoke. You're like. Because like people don't do that. It's so odd that, and for you people that are wanting to go watch, if you've ever been to a powerlifting meet, let's just be honest, powerlifting meets are awful to watch. They're horrible. Yeah, they, they can get really boring. And even powerlifters are going to admit, look, unless you're under the bar competing, it's pretty boring to watch. Yeah, so if you're, and if you're a family member of a com- competitive powerlifter, you're excited for about nine minutes during a 13-hour day. For the nine attempts of your the husband that you're watching, that's when you're excited. Other than that, it's just boring. And everybody's squatting. If you're not somebody that's really into lifting, like squatting 600 pounds versus squatting 800 pounds versus squatting 450 to the average human, it's just all a bunch of weight on a barbell. But strongman is a blast because you get to watch people pick up cars. You get to watch people pick up huge rocks. Between the events, most of the time, if you come out and ask – can I just touch that rock? You could like, oh my God, this is actually like a 400 pound ball of concrete. And so I feel like it makes it a little more real to the general public. No, it absolutely does. And, and <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, strongman, when you get to an event and the athletes are at the competition, it's kind of like your old college days or high school days where you've got something dumb to do and you're like, who wants to do it first? Yeah. You get to the strongman competition and you're like, uh, you guys know the best way to do this? And they're like, well, I did it in training and I kind of did this. Another guy would be like, ah, I kind of did it like this. And you just learn. You're right. Like you go to a strongman competition and they will teach you. Just in January, I mean, I've been competing, what, six or seven years now. And there was an event I had never done before. What was it? And those guys were like, man, I really recommend it. It was the duck walk. Um, okay. We've gotten a duck walk at our place and I had failed it every single time. So explain what that is so they know what a duck walk is. Oh, man. It's, <laughs> it's like if you were to pick something up really heavy, and walk with it between your legs with your arms down at your waist like it, again like a like a super heavy kettlebell just again imagine like what what do they tend to weigh 300 pounds something ridiculous yeah i think ours at our last competition was uh, our duck walk was 365 pounds so you pick it up and it has to be carried in front of you and you literally waddle side to side as fast as you can <laughs> right for like 25 feet yeah it's like a sumo deadlift that you run with it's exact. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. And so, <laughs> yeah. and you do that. We did. We had like a, I think it was a two hundred and eighty or two hundred ninety pound farmers for sixty feet. Then you pick up the sumo deadlift and you run with it. And then at the very end of the course, you actually have to put it up on those power stairs we mentioned earlier, with like yeah. eighteen inches and the twenty four inches. And then you're done. Yeah. So let's add these three worst, most taxing events and put them all together and see how well you do. Yeah. I remember that. I think the hardest event I've ever had in competition is for at America's Strongest Man. In, in Philly in 2007, we had an event like that. We had a uh, 330 or 335 pound farmers per hand, set it down, 930 pound yoke, set it down, and then the worst tire I've ever flipped in my life for 75 feet. 
So after they get you horribly exhausted with essentially non-explosive movements, like farmers and a yoke aren't really explosive. I mean, you're, they're athletic. You pick up something heavy and you're, you're moving with it as quickly as you can, but it doesn't really require like a high amount of power output. You don't have to go boom, right? Tire flip you do. So you do this like this long farmers and this long yoke, and then you're like, oh my God, now I've got to flip this horrendous. At all the guys, you know, they'd flip number four. They'd throw up in the on the side of the street on the gutter. They'd flip another one. It was just, it was the 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 lactate was awful, and uh, and that's what that's what strongman is. By the way, though, if you had the chance to do that, wouldn't you take that over over riding like the Echo bike or running the or running the C two rower? And again, I love those machines. It's so much more fun. I would make myself vomit doing strongman than just getting on a treadmill or an echo bike and doing something like that. Or the skiers, the skiers are terrible. <laughs> oh, I've done a ski erg one time in my whole life, and I was like, "That's it. That's all I'm doing. I'll never touch one of those yeah, again." I ordered, I ordered one for the gym, and I ordered one for the gym. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's it's uh so strongman's awesome. And the other thing that's nice about it is if you've got a training partner. Or, uh, or several training partners, but at least one, you can compete at the cardio. You can compete at the conditioning, right? And it's much harder to compete at conditioning, at least in a way to, it's hard to get excited about competing against who can row the fastest, you know, 200 meter rows with 60 seconds in between. You're just like, this is not exciting. Uh, there's something way more fun to have all these kind of odd objects. You got a sandbag and a, and a stone, like a natural stone and a concrete block and, a, and to see who can pick them up and run 25 feet with them and load them on a platform as fast as you can. So your buddy times, times you on his stopwatch on his phone and then you do the same thing for him and you compete against each other. And sometimes you'll get done. You'll be like, you know what? I think I can beat that. Now I can beat your time. Set it back up. Do it all over again. And it makes conditioning a blast. And it's, it makes it feel a lot less like work. What work is, is setting up strongman events. That sucks. That's the worst part of the yeah. whole thing. You know, you got to do a yoke or farmer's walk, and, and they've got, you know, you talk about those farmer's walks having 250 or 300 pounds per hand. Kind of sucks to set it up. Kind of sucks to do a yoke. What you'll do with a yoke, it's not quite as bad. The setup, it's the takedown. So you get that yoke, you put a plate on just like you would on squat. You do a run, you put another plate on, you do a run, you put another plate on, you do a run. At some point, you've got like eight plates on each side, and then you're real exhausted. And then you got to clean it all back up, and you're like, "Oh God, this is where I, this is where I was always like, man, if I ever hit it big, I would just have people in the gym that were just like plate loaders and unloaders. Like, can you please load this? You set it up, and you're like, you get done training, and you're exhausted because you've just done the event. And you're like, oh man, I I don't want to take all this back down. Yeah, but yeah. and just to backtrack a little bit, you know, you're talking about like how much fun it is to condition in the form of strongman and in watching the sport of strongman, and it, it's kind of like a scary movie. I think part of the uh, adrenaline that you get watching and competing is kind of that danger factor, you know, cause it's, it's not common stuff. And so you yeah. kind of get excited. Like, man, if this dude moves any faster, like he's, he's going to blow a quad. Like something is going to happen. Is something is going to happen. It's that adrenaline just over and over and over again. And yeah, it just makes it so exciting to watch. Yeah. There's, there's something deep inside many of us. And I, I don't know that it's, that it's straight up a, like, I don't know if it's like a, a male versus female thing. Cause I've seen some completely badass females do this. And I've also seen like some complete pansy males who don't, aren't mentally tough enough to do it either. But for, for, for me having this thing that I'm like, I don't know if I can do this. And there's also something that's sort of primal and I don't know if masculine is the right word, but kind of primal about it. You're like, I want to see if I can do it's that idea of like, could I go out and live in the woods for three straight days with nothing but a pocket knife or something? You're like, you know, if I told my wife that my wife would be like, why would you want to do that? And I'm like, that sounds awesome. Are you serious? Like that sounds, and we're just wired different. Well, straw man's kind of the same way. You see this giant rock. You're like, I wonder if I can pick that up. <laughs> and so there's, it's something cool about it. You know, that's just, just, it takes these things. And by the way, some of those, some of those events and some of the implements can be a little bit expensive, but a lot of them are either free or really cheap, right? Like you can get a used tires are free. If you've got, a, if you've got a place that, especially if you're in an area like we are with rock quarries and you got earth mover tires, you can show up in your pickup truck. They, when they have a blowout on one of those tires, they, they, the EPA makes them get rid of them because they can't have mosquitoes running around in them and stuff and spreading 
all diseases and stuff. So a lot of times you can get those tire blowouts or or tires that have torn and they're free, right? So rocks are free. You talked about finding like, you know, tractor axles. A lot of times you can get for free or for almost nothing. You can go to a junkyard and get stuff a lot of times for 15 or 20 bucks. You can make a lot of this stuff. You don't have to go out and buy the nicest yoke there is. There Now, I can remember even having, we had made a homemade, when I first started, my yoke was a homemade cambered bar. I went and bought a bunch of Schedule 80 pipe. I cut the pipe down, and it was a huge camber, like a 24-inch camber. I don't know if you remember that old bar that I had. And we just put, uh, we just welded 90-degree angles on it. And while the yoke didn't go all the way down to the floor, we could load a bunch of weight of it up, and we could still hold on to it on the sides rather than holding on to it like a barbell. We'd take it out of a rack, and we go out. We take it actually out of squat stands, and we go run with it. And we'd have another set of squat stands down there, and we'd run down until we sit on the squat stands. Well, that's a little more ballsy than running with a yoke, because like if something goes bad with a yoke, you can just set the yoke on the ground. But if you got six hundred pounds on your back on a cambered bar, and you go down, you're going down with the weight. And so, but it didn't cost anything. It's, that stuff is cheap to, to no, mess around with. It, it is cheap. And I, when I first got into Strongman, I just rented a storage unit. And every Saturday, I would take all the weights from my home gym. When I still live with my parents, I'd grab all those weights. I'd go up to the storage unit and I would train. And my log was a rectangle. I built it out of two by fours yeah. with some pipe on the end and pipe in the center. And, you know, it was the worst thing to clean, but cleaning a log, it made cleaning a log easy. Yeah. Um, my yoke was homemade as well. I made it out of wood and some like three inch steel pipe. Um, farmers and uh, frame carry. I just use a, a basic trap bar. I think I think most gym owners probably have, or home gym owners probably have a trap bar or some form of fashion of it. Yeah, super beneficial in the sport of strongman. There's so many things, and it's it's carrying heavy things, and you know grip strength is going to be a huge portion of it as well. And there's so many things. You pick up two forty five pound plates that are back to back and start working your grip strength. You know, yeah, because that's going to be the biggest factor when you get to strongman. Um, with a lot of those moving movement uh, implements and medleys. Is going to be someone's grip strength. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. I, I think back, the strongest my back ever was, and the strongest my grip ever was, was when I was training strongman. And I don't know how often I train grip just to train grip for fun, like just the just the nature of doing heavy farmers walks and things like that. And a lot of times, now we would do farmers walks for holds sometimes, especially at the end of farmers walks. It's a great grip exercise. But like, I didn't really mess around too much, like with the captains of crush grippers and, and stuff like that. I can do those okay. And I've got kind of small hands. And so, but I can do, but it's not because I trained those. It's because I trained strongman. And then my back was the same. The, the heaviest I could ever deadlift in my life, I was obviously deadlifting a lot, like actual normal deadlifts. But the other thing I was doing is like, I don't know that you can get your back stronger if it's already strong, decently strong, then picking up heavy stones off the ground. Like that's so much harder for your back. Those heavy stones, heavy farmers, like it's brutal. Yeah. I don't know if there's enough. I don't know if there's, I mean, side, strong man aside, I don't know if there's another movement that would even come close to mimicking picking up a 350 pound stone. Yeah. You're I'll never more it. rounded. <laughs> you know, like yeah. you it's have the to. worst, it's the worst two foot deficit you've ever done for a yep. deadlift. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you you could practice Uber deficit deadlifts where the bar is right on top of your shoes, but it's just not the same. It's just not the same. As a matter of fact, I would think a really heavy zercher off of the floor would probably carry over better than a super intense deficit. Like get down, literally put the weight on the floor, get underneath it until you're the bar is in the crooks of your elbows and then stand up with it. That probably is the best mimic for a squat or for a for stones. And oh, by the way, is there anything and don't more straighten your back? Right, right, right. You just yeah, you've got it. It's you're gonna have to straight leg and round it because there's no way to get down there otherwise. Is there anything more humbling than the first time you touch Atlas stones? You're just like, oh, I don't know what is it. And they'll be like, how much is this stone? They'll be like, oh, it's like 175 pounds, you know. And you're like, oh, girls do this, and then you start to pick it up. And you're like, oh my god. This, in fact, is awful. You know, in powerlifting, you have, like you said earlier, everybody has their own version of what is the perfect squat, bench, deadlift, and press, right? Um, and that happens in strongman as well. But the difference is in strongman, you have to train out of movement. And when I say that, I mean, you can, there is no, you can't have perfect form. It's like, like you were just talking about, you're like, we're going to get down and we're going to do a deficit, search, or squat. Don't round your back because when you go to strongman, you're going to have your background. When you get out of place, you're going to get hurt. So let's right. train that way. So when that does happen under a heavy load, you don't get injured. That's right. 
yeah, if you if you train with barbells and you get yourself generally strong, we also know that you're generally more resilient and less vulnerable to injury. When then you add strongman training to your training, to your like all strongmen still do they they most strongmen train a lot like powerlifters plus they do all the strongman events, right? And so they still train like they train the big four lifts and and whatnot, maybe bench press a little less, but they do those things. Well, when you add the strongman implements, what it does, especially if you do it carefully and like conservatively and still you can almost like linear progress even your strongman implements what you'll find is once you're two three four six months in on strongman training you're probably the most resilient you've ever been to injury because now you've had to learn how to pick up with rounded backs and and straight legs and you've learned how to you've had to like run down the street with heavy weight on your back you've had to learn how to have lateral movement which never happens in powerlifting right so things like like you, you think about that when that heavy yoke is on your back or heavy farmers and you're running down the street and it's you know for easy math let's say it's a thousand pounds which is a lot and more than what most people do do but it's not a thousand pounds on your back like it is on a squat it's a thousand pounds on one leg and then it's a thousand pounds on another leg because you're you're running, you're walking as fast as you can. So it's not like it's a thousand pounds evenly distributed on both legs. It's all on the right foot, all on the left foot, all on the right foot, all on. And that's that's you start thinking about like that isn't that in fact is not healthy, and it is it you can become injured. But if you start not at thousand pound yoke runs, but you start with three hundred pound yoke runs, you know, and then slowly start to increase that then you'll be surprised at what I think you'll you'll see your you know the 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 tendons and ligaments in your knees in your hips and your ankles your feet strength your hand strength your back strength like those things all become more resilient as you start to add some of those things to your training and, and again then it just makes conditioning a blast yeah and, and strongman is not a sport that you can necessarily train every day that you can train you know if you train powerlifting four or five days a week let's train strongman three to four days a week and we're gonna have to take a day in there where it's just prehab and rehab because you've got to recover you know a lot of times we would set up a training block like train mondays and wednesdays and then fridays are going to be a prehab and recovery day uh, to try and recover from those days and then saturday is going to be our strongman day and when you train strongman you, you like i just said you don't want to do the implements every single day but you also need to be aware of how you're training them so earlier we mentioned grip strength you know training grip strength uh within a twice within a two-week period your forearms aren't recovered yet that's just the way yeah. it is yeah you know, and if you try and be super explosive and train your react reactive strength with your super heavy training, you're not going to get very good results. And when, if you do do that, um, cause it, it is possible, but you got to be very careful on how you do it because reactive strength, strength, endurance, and overall power are very, very, uh, they're similar in certain ways, but they're also very different. And, you know, power and reactive strength are going to be there. Uh, but now we've got to turn that reactive strength into strength endurance to last those minutes. So, you know, you got to be careful on how you train. You can't just go in and train strongman every single day. You will get hurt. You have yeah. to take into account your recovery for it and what you're training and how you're training. Yeah. Yeah. I know for, for most, you know, the way you just set that up on, on programming is that what most people do is they make, they have one day that's like the high impact day. And a lot of times that's Saturday. And it's a lot of times it's Saturday because again, strongman is kind of a blue collar sport. A lot of guys work normal, kind of they're working Monday through Friday. Your Saturday strongman training day is also a longer session. Again, and a lot of that just because it takes a long time to like load up the weights on the farmers and, and take them back off and the same thing on the yoke and set up all your stuff. And so a lot of times that really high impact day that's going to take some time to recover from will happen just one time a week on Saturday. And then you can do stuff like odd implement overhead presses and it's not really high impact. And you still have your squats and you still have your normal deadlifts where you're not bouncing all over the place and it's not super... So that way you can set up your training again, a lot like actually it reminds me a lot of what the old York uh, barbell club guys did out in, in York, Pennsylvania, when they were when they were some of the best Olympic weightlifters in the world. They basically train like powerlifters during the week and maybe they would do some power versions of the snatch and the clean, but they mostly did their competitive snatch and clean and jerks on Saturdays because it was, you know, it was more explosive, more power, but also more impact. And then they needed the time to recover from that. And so you wouldn't typically have a day that you do yoke and another day that you do log and or another day that you do farmers and another day that you do power stairs because all of those things are just so high impact that it's actually better to put those kind of on one day, 
know that you're going to beat yourself up. Spend the rest of the day. It's the weekend, so also your calories tend to be higher. Go have the big barbecue. Go sit in the pool. Spend the rest of your weekend trying to recover, and then it's a blast. That's the other thing. It's just super fun yeah. to do. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Like you, you put your strongman training on Saturday because the worst thing you can do is get to a competition and be like, holy crap, this is heavy, right? Yeah. And so we're going to play with you know percentages at competition and try and mimic it on Saturdays. But it's very likely it'll take you a week to recover from that Saturday. So, you know, heavy, heavy training on your Saturdays for all your strongman stuff. Monday is going to be a lower body explosive day. Go heavy. Wednesday is going to be a lower uh, upper body explosive day. Not going heavy. Friday is full for recovery. And I think the mindset for whether it's, you know, beginning to intermediate lifters or um, people that have been powerlifting for a long time, it's I'm going to train more or sorry, powerlifters that haven't been training for a long time. I'm going to train more and that makes me stronger. No, uh, training only breaks down muscle tissue and makes you weaker. It's the recovery that makes you stronger, yeah. right? So if you're just having such a taxing day on a Saturday, we need that time to recover so that we don't get injured and that we actually get stronger because Saturdays are so taxing. Yeah, you're right. I mean, they might be three, four, five hour training sessions and that's not an average gym session for anybody. Right. Yep. That's good. Dude, thanks for being on the show. This has been a blast to get started how can people find you and get a hold of you? What's the easiest way to, to find you? Uh, so Instagram is GP underscore Spencer Graham. Uh, our Instagram for our GP page, if you go to our GP page, we actually have a library where you can learn strongman implements. You can learn movements and things like that. Um, it's a YouTube video with my smiling face on it, and I get to sit there and talk. Uh, the website is gpathletics.net. So you can follow us on our Instagram, follow us on our website, and you'll get information for strongman and powerlifting. Uh, and then you can also follow me and you can always hit me up if you have questions about strongman training. Awesome. If you're in the Midwest, especially if you're in Missouri, you should make a trip out to GP Athletics. It's really, it's one of the nicest gyms um, that I've ever seen. Uh, I, I don't want to necessarily say that Strong Gym had a big impact on that. One of the things that was great, though, about, you know, we we at Strong, we you, you've done a much better job years down the road in what I see in your gym than what we did at Strong. But hopefully we laid some groundwork in that, what you often see is that these hardcore training gyms are uber hardcore and they're dirty and disgusting and gross and they bad customer service. And I think one of the things we tried to push for at Strong was it was a serious gym to train, but it was like really clean, good customer service, things like that. And the, it was the first thing I noticed when I walked into your gym the very first time was like, oh my God, the gym is like, it's super, it's, it's super hardcore and super badass and tons of places to squat and Olympic lifting platforms and every piece of equipment you'd ever want in a million years and all of the strongman stuff. But it's also really clean, really organized, great customer service. And like that's that's rare. That's what's so wild is it's rare. So if you're in the Midwest, you've got to reach out and see this gym. Come If you're coming through, it's also awesome that we've got, you know, I-44, one of the longest interstates in the, in the whole country runs right through Springfield. So if you're traveling through, lots of people travel through Springfield, get down and train at the gym for sure. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Awesome. Dude, thanks for being on the show. You've been listening to another episode of Barbell Logic Podcast. We'd love a five-star review at iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast. You can find us on Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Overcast, any of those fun places. Give us a five-star review. And you can reach out if you have questions for us at questions at barbell-logic.com, and we will get to your question on a future show. Spencer, thanks again for doing the show, and we'll see you guys in a couple days. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. <laughs>